So we're here because we love to teach math. We're all math teachers. I'm a math teacher. I've been uh, doing it for five years and I absolutely love it. And uh, I've worked at Maple before, but uh, got into teaching because I thought it was more interesting. But I still use Maple in the classroom. And what I thought I'd show you today is uh, a couple of things that I've done in the classroom that have really uh, helped my students to enjoy the math that they would otherwise only see on a whiteboard or chalkboard. So I will show you four things today. The first is how to bridge the gap between what I call SOHCAHTOA and sine waves. And then we'll go into a, a couple of other fun explorations that students have inspired me to go into after uh, questions in the classroom. So for let's get started. So let's go to trigonometry for a little bit. So here's the basic problem in trigonometry from a pedagogical point of view. Students are presented in usually one grade level with learning the SOHCAHTOA rule, sine, cosine, and tangent, and how to find sides of right triangles. Then in the next grade, we usually teach them how to graph these functions, and they see these waves. And at some point, they might start to wonder, how did we get from solving sides of right triangles to graphing things that look like waves? How did we get here? What is the relationship between this representation of sine, cosine, tangent, and this one? And this is a very difficult concept to illustrate on the chalkboard, how we get from here to there. And Maple is a great tool for doing it. Without further ado, let me just show you one thing. And this is what showed it first to me when I was learning it myself. Just watch for a second, then I'll explain to you what you're seeing. We'll let it run through a second time, and then I'll pause it in the middle of the third round, and then we'll discuss what it is we're looking at here. All right, let's freeze it right there. What we're seeing is a right triangle embedded in a circle, and this is the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, so the radius is 1. And if you study this picture for a second, you'll see that the height of the red curve at any point, in other words, the y value, is precisely the height of the right triangle at that point. In other words, this is the value of y. Now, how do we get y if we know theta? Well, students should know by now that the height, if the radius is 1, should simply be the sine of the angle theta. And so as you allow the right triangle to move, in other words, let theta increase, you see the sine value of theta changing as a function of time. And so here we have a visual link between right triangles and the wave pattern that they've been taught how to graph. Let's do the same thing for cosine. Once again, I'll just let you watch it two iterations through, and then we'll talk about what we're looking at. All right, let's freeze it right about here. Let's back up a bit. So the height of the green line, we have a little bit of a teaching challenge because we want to graph the height, but we know it's the width of the right triangle that is generating this. So that is why we have the black reflecting mirror tilted at a 45 degree angle. Let's see if we can figure out why that's accomplishing what we want. So the height of this curve is the height of this distance here between the mirror and the x-axis. Well, because that's a 45 degree angle, that is also the distance between the midpoint of the mirror and this dashed line, which happens to be the width of the right triangle, which, as we have taught students, should be cosine of theta if the radius of that right triangle is 1. And so here we have a representation of the cosine function. So once again, a link between right triangles and the waveforms that they have been taught how to graph. This is a very difficult concept to convey if your only tool is a whiteboard or a chalkboard, and this is why tools like Maple are absolutely essential for building some of these bridges. Now, just for fun, this has nothing to do with pedagogy. This is not for learning. This is just for pure old fun. Let's watch both of them at the same time. 
And this is where you get the gold coins. At this point, you should be getting applause from your students, or at least several gold coins. This is what you show in the last two minutes to kick them off for a nice weekend. Look what I learned today. Now, can we view the tangent in the same way? Let's see if we can draw the tangent graph with the unit circle. Okay, let's freeze it right there, let's back this up. And now this is a good investigation for students. Instead of just showing them this passively, see if they can figure out why, after having seen the two previous animations, why this particular mechanical setup is generating the graph of the tangent function. This is something you might show in pre-calculus. So have them stare at the picture, and probably after about five minutes, some of the smarter students will realize that this line here is one long from the center of the circle to the green line has length one because it's a unit circle so we're moving a distance one and in that span we're climbing a height that is equal to the tangent of angle theta now why is that this is a nice little problem for them to solve so the smarter of them will realize that look the width of the triangle is cosine the height is sine of theta and rise over run from grade nine we know is the slope so the slope of the hypotenuse of the triangle is equal to sine of theta over cosine theta, which is precisely the tangent. Aha, uh -huh. so the slope of this dashed line is the tangent of theta. And so now if we know, let's take a look at this little expression here, y equals mx, that's what they learned from grade 9. Let's fill in the values we know. We know m is tangent theta, and the x value, we're moving over one unit. So m times x is tangent theta times 1, which is just tangent theta. Therefore, y, the height of this green triangle, which is mapped to the height of the red curve, is the tangent theta. That's why this works. And lo and behold, there it is. Now you could certainly do, on, do all this on the chalkboard, but isn't it a lot more fun if you have a tool like this? and a lot more engaging for the students. Now, how did I do this? Let's, let's back up just a little bit. Let me show you some of the code I used to generate this. It does require some learning of Maple syntax, but that is well worth learning. You notice that it's involved, but not too terribly long. What I have done to generate, for example, this sign animation is to create a Maple procedure. I gave it a name, draw sine wave, and it's a procedure that's a function of t. And I have a name for the sine wave itself, that's simply the plot of sine of theta, where theta goes from 0 up to t, where t is the parameter that's changing. And then we have tick marks there, and then with the other components in the graphic. There's, a, there's the circle, the unit circle, there's the dash line, there's the radius line, and the late theta label. All of those are, little, are different plots that depend upon where t is and this value of a, which is the center of the circle, which I've just chosen arbitrarily. So I've chosen A to be negative 2 just to push the circle a little bit off the, the axis so you, it's not crowding the, the, the wave. And so each of those is simply a plot between two points. And then once I've generated all those pieces, I use the display command to combine them all. So there's the sine wave itself, there's the unit circle, the dashed line, the radial line, the theta label, and the scaling. And then I simply create the animation by using the animate command, there's the name of the function, there's the parameter, and I let t go from 0 up to 4 pi, give it a number of frames, and then give the name of this, and off we go. And the same thing for cosine and tangent. So doing this requires a little bit of makeable expertise, but it is well worth learning because you can generate a lot of really, really neat uh, interactive things with your kids that way.
For the second part of our presentation, I'd like to go to a question that a student asked me in class one day after we were doing uh, equations of circles, and we were trying to illustrate, I was trying to teach them how the Pythagorean theorem is related to the circle equation. Because as you know, the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared is c squared, and the equation of a circle when centered at 0, 0 looks an awful lot like that. Something squared plus something squared is something squared, and it turns out that's not an accident. They're just different manifestations of the same concept. And so I showed them this. So first I'll just show you the graph, and then I'll show you uh, the maple syntax needed to generate that. So we're graphing, in comparison, x plus y equals 9, and x squared plus y squared is 9. And now students might ask, hey, how come we don't see the line? Because I've taught them, okay, this is a line, and this should be a circle. Where is the line? Well, after a few minutes of thought, they realize that, okay, this window is only going from 4 to minus 4, whereas this equation should have y-intercept 9, x-intercept 9. So what we need to do is back up. So in Maple's tools here, you can push the scaling button. Now let's back this up a little bit. Aha, there's our line. And sure enough, it has x and y-intercept 9. So the question I got one day after we did this is, a kid asked me, what if the Pythagorean theorem were cubed? Now I had no idea what he meant by that, and I'm not sure he knew what he meant by that, but he was curious. He was thinking, what kind of things happen if, if we did a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed? Now, that, I didn't want to go into um, Fermat's little theorem at this point, because it was a little bit too arcane, given what this uh, class's ability level was. So I decided to take this in a different direction. What if we could graph x cubed plus y cubed equals something? What would that look like? If the exponent on the x and y are 1, we get a straight line. They knew that from grade 9. If the exponent on the x and y is 2, we get a circle. We just taught them that the day before. What would happen if we change that to a 3? I, in fact, didn't know myself. I'd never actually done that. So I did a little investigation myself the night before and decided to show it to the kids. So what would the graph of x cubed plus y cubed equals 9 look like? All right, well, let's take a look. Let's generate a plot of that implicit function. Now, we don't call it that in front of the kids. That's our notation. And let's display all three curves together. P1 is the line. P2 is the circle. P3 is this new thing. We're not sure what it looks like. And it looks something like that. Now, I happen to know from having worked with Maple for a long time that that's not what that curve is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be a smooth curve. And what's usually happened is that the implicit plot function in Maple is generating solutions to this equation uh, by sampling values on the x-axis. And when you get a jagged line like that, that means it's not sampling at a high enough frequency. So we need to intervene here and tell it to sample at a higher frequency. So we, let's go, we can do this. Num points equals some high value, let's say 5,000. So it'll tell Maple to sample 5,000 points when generating that solution curve. And there we go. This is the equation. x cubed plus y cubed equals 9. Now let's back this on up. Let's see, let's compare that to the line. And we'll see something interesting. In fact, the farther we zoom out, the more interesting it becomes. So what we see is that the line x plus y equals 9 looks an awful lot like x cubed plus y cubed equals 9, except that it's closer to the origin and we have this little bulge inside the unit circle. I wonder what that means. So now students are begging, up, well, what happens if you let the exponent be 4? Sure, let's try it. And this is what Maple is great for. Let's do it. Let's generate a plot up to level 4. And this time we're going to display the line, the circle, the cubic one, and the quartic one. So now, this is this quadratic one. This is with exponent 4. So it looks like, kind of like the unit circle, except it's smaller and more square-like, though not quite a square. Let's back it up again. And so at this point, before I entertain the question, what happens if we let the exponent be 5, I ask the students to try to make a prediction. All right, you've seen four examples, exponent 1, 2, 3, and 4. What do you think the next one should be? And I let them debate that for a little bit to see what kind of ideas we get. 
and you get all kinds of answers. Oh, you're going to see a triangle. Some will say, oh, you'll see a spiral. But some of the more perceptive them will figure out there's an even odd pattern going on here. Look, line, closed loop, line, closed loop. And the smarter of them will figure out or should be able to induce that if we let the x1 to be 5, we should get some kind of a curve that looks like the red ones. And let's test that hypothesis. And this is when I say, now we're starting to become mathematicians. This is how mathematicians think. They make some observations, form a hypothesis, and test the hypothesis. So let's make graphs for 5, graphs for exponent 6, and let's display them all at once. And look at that. So it looks like the 6 is inside the previous boxy-looking thing. The 5 is another curve that looked kind of like the cubic one, but it's closer to the origin and is more the bulge is more pronounced, even though it's smaller. Let's back this up again and get the full picture. Odd is the straight line, even closed loop. Odd straight line, even closed loop. Odd straight line, even closed loop. And now, of course, the kids are dying to know, what happens if you make the exponent like 10,000, a million? That's what they're shouting out in the middle of class. Now, I don't have the patience to do all that, but I will just to see just to satisfy the curiosity, let's see what happens if we go to 99 and 100. Why not? Let's just see. And notice right here I've had to make the num points very high on this because this solution curve is very tight. And the tighter the curve is, the more sampling, the greater sampling frequency you need to see a smooth curve. All right. Let's view just those two by themselves without the others. In fact, let's just view the red, the... 101 all by itself. All right, so it looks like the one, exponent 100 generates almost a perfect square. And we could have sort of predicted that because that's what was happening. We were seeing a circle, then kind of a bulgy loop, and now a straight loop. Let's add the 99. Let's do the 99 just by itself, see what we get. Mm-hmm. Let's compare that to P1 p3, and p5. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful mathematics. Let's back that up so we can see the line. 1, 3, 5, skip a few, get to 99. And so now I ask students to, to try to describe this general pattern. And they, the more perceptive than them should be able to say, okay, the higher the exponent, the closer you get to the origin, the more pronounced the bump, and the sharper the bump gets until finally you get an infinitely sharp bump at the point 1, 1. Now let's do the evens. Let's just view 2, 4, 6, and the 100. Wonderful. So we start out with a perfect circle, start, slowly start to crunch in, and we get down to 1. And as a challenge question, I wouldn't take this up this on the same day, but I would send that home with the more cha with the more able students. Why does the square stop at one? Why doesn't it shrink down, keep shrinking down to zero? And that that's an interesting uh, exploration to do. So now I have students try to formulate their own theorem. So let p be the exponent in the equation x to the p plus y to the p equals any constant. We pick nine. Let's see, let's see what happens. We've observed that when p is an even number, the graph of the equation is a closed loop. And that that loop becomes more and more box-like as p increases. When p is an odd number, the graph of the equation is a line that bulges in the middle. And the bulge gets more corner-like as p increases. And I remind students once again, this is what it means to be a mathematician, is you start with something basic, just lines and circles, and you start to wonder. Being a math mathematician is about wondering. You ask questions. What would the next obvious thing look like? You test it. You keep going at the next level, and you start to see some patterns, and then you try to characterize the patterns in a theorem. That's how all mathematics works. And the great thing about Maple is you could never, ever do this on a board. You would have no idea how to generate solutions for that. It would, it would, just to generate a table of values for this would take 20 minutes. 
and by then the students are bored and cranky, not paying attention, and the impact is lost. You've lost the momentum. What Maple allows you to do is to keep the momentum going by letting it handle the nasty calculations and let the students see the cool results and test their hypotheses. And all this came from a silly, poorly motivated, poorly formulated question that came at the end of class one day from some kid who had no idea what he was talking about. What if the Pythagorean theorem were cubed? And that question led to some marvelous insights. Let's go to the, the main event for this, for this little webinar, why I needed maple to make cream cheese frosting. I try, as a math teacher, I am constantly on the lookout for math questions that are really relevant to everyday life, not ones you find in a textbook because those are dull and they're, they're poorly motivated and really have little to do with anything the students would ever encounter in real life. This is a problem that I actually wind up, wound up having to solve. I was in the kitchen making cream cheese frosting with my kids because we were making a cake for mom. And we had a recipe for cream cheese frosting. It asked for 8 ounces, which is an American measure. In Canada, where I live, we measure things in grams. So that's about 240 grams. Well, we got the tub of cream cheese out, and I didn't have a kitchen scale. So I had to think, how am I going to get out 240 grams? I could guess, I could take an educated guess, but as a mathematician, that just doesn't satisfy me. So the question is, how deep into a 400 gram tub do you need to scoop to get 240 grams if the whole thing is 400? Here's kind of a mathematical representation of that problem. So the blue represents the Philadelphia cream cheese tub, and the red plane represents the depth to which we would scoop cream cheese out, and the goal is to get exactly 240 grams out. Well, I got my ruler from the downstairs basement and uh, measured the radius of the top of the tub. It's 4.5 centimeters. The radius of the bottom is 3. The height of the tub is 8. How deep into those 8 centimeters should I dig to get out 240 grams? Now, any reasonable chef would just say, look, just guess. It'll be just fine. But we're not ordinary chefs. We are mathematicians, and we're training our kids to be mathematicians, too. So here we have to be nerds, unabashed nerds. Now before we jump into the nasty mathematics of that, let's back up a little bit and think, what would we do if this were a nice shape, like a cylinder? Like if this were just a Coke can or something, and, and we wanted to find 240 out of 400 grams, well that's just, when you reduce that fraction, it's three-fifths. Uh, I've actually had maple do that, by the way, I can show you how that works. If you enter a fraction in maple and you just do uh, control equals normally, Yes, it will reduce that fraction if possible. Okay, so we're looking for basically three-fifths of the volume of that tub. Well, if the tub were a cylinder, all we would have to do is take three-fifths of the height, and that's easy to measure, at least gauge with, gauge with your eye. But with a shape like this, that doesn't work. This is a shape called a truncated cone. And it's halfway between a cylinder and a cone. Now, I looked up the volume formula. You can actually derive this. It's, it's, an, it's a good exercise for a math teacher to do, but if you're too lazy or you don't have time to do that, look it up on Google. There's the formula for a truncated cone, where big R represents the radius at the top, little r is the radius at the bottom, and h is the height of the whole thing. And you could put that in front of students and say, does that look familiar? And most of them will, will stare at you because they're intimidated by anything that looks complicated. But after a while, they should see that this looks kind of like the formula for the volume of a cylinder, and it looks kind of like the formula for the volume of a cone. Let's see how. What would happen to the shape if little r were big R? Okay, let's come back up to the picture here. So here's our tub of cream cheese. If little r were the same as big R, well, that should just be a cylinder. Shouldn't that formula then just reduce the volume of a cylinder? Well, let's see. This is a great thing that Mabel can do. Let's right-click on that formula here. And let's evaluate that formula at little r equals capital R. So this should give us a cylinder. And lo and behold, look at that, pi h r squared. That is the formula for the volume of the cylinder. Now how did that happen? So if you're in a class on a whiteboard, you can do this. Let's see, if r is big R, let's see, we get, that should be big R squared, show us that. So we get 3r squared 
divided by 3 is just r squared. Oh, neat. That's pretty cool. What if r is 0? Have students make a prediction. Well, look. That should go to 0. That should go to 0, leaving just everything else, which is the formula for the volume of a ordinary cone. Let's see if Maple agrees. Let's evaluate that at r equals 0. 1 third pi hr squared. Beautiful. Really neat. Okay, so we can kind of see that this is halfway, in a sense, between the formula for a cylinder and a cone. Now that we're ready to tackle the mathematical model. So we're trying to find d. We're after that. Let d be the depth we scoop out. Let s of d be the radius of the tub at depth d. And notice that will depend on how big d is. The larger d is, the smaller s will become. Then let f of d be the fraction of the tub's total volume we remove if we scoop to depth d. So in other words, f of d is a percent. So if d is 0, obviously f of d is 0. Good question to pose to kids. What is f of big H? In other words, if we let d go all the way to h, what should f of d be? Let them think for a second. They should see, okay, that's the whole thing. That's 100%. Okay, so f of h should be 1. All right, with that notation in hand, let's make a little plan here. We're going to find a formula for f of d. In other words, we want a formula for the percent of the tub's total volume we're going to scoop out. And our tool is going to be similar triangles. And I'll show you that in a second. So we're basically going to take this picture, look at it in profile, and make triangles out of this. Once we've got a formula for that, then we're going to set that formula equal to 3 fifths, because that's the fraction of the tub's total volume that we require, because we wanted 240 grams. We're going to solve that for d. That will be a formula in terms of my other parameters, big R, little r, and h. Now, if you're in a grade 12 calculus class, you can just do it like this. If you're in a grade 11 class, I recommend giving these hard values and not treat them as parameters. So then we'd just be dealing with one variable here. Finally, we measure these things, and we're going to substitute them into the solution. That's the plan. All right, so the volume of the whole tub is this. That's the formula for the volume of the whole tub. The volume we scoop out is also itself another truncated cone. Let's, let's take a look and see why. Notice if we look above the red plane, that shape is also a truncated cone with a given radius at the bottom, radius at the top, where the height this time is d, and the radius at the bottom is not little r, but s of d. So the scooped volume should be this formula evaluated when big H is D and little r is little s. Let's do that. Let's highlight this and let's evaluate it at those things. Evaluate at a point. Well, let's call this volume scooped. And we said big H was going to be D and we said little r was going to be s. Okay, and so Maple has made those substitutions for us just like that. And now the fraction of the tub's total volume we scooped is just going to be this divided by the original volume. And that's easy to do in Maple. We can ask kids to predict what's going to happen. Smarter kids will realize the one-thirds are going to cancel, the pies are going to cancel. But let's just do it anyway. So we're going to copy that. Hit the division bar. We're going to copy this. Put it under there. Hit return, and Maple should simplify it for us, and lo and behold, it does. Notice Maple automatically canceled out the one-thirds. It canceled out the pies, leaving just that. Now, we're trying to set this equal to three-fifths, remember that, and solve for d. But first, we need to get, before we can do that, we need to express s in terms of, of little d, r, big R, and h. And to do that, we're going to use similar triangles. So this is the truncated cone in profile. So we're looking at it uh, in a, as a projection here. So down here is little r, up here is big R, and we've made a dashed line at the level r. So if this bottom of this right triangle is big R minus r, so when you add the two together, you get big R. Same thing down here. If you add those two together, you get little s. This is d, and the whole thing is h. By similar triangles, you can see that the base of this triangle divided by the base of the larger triangle should be the same proportion as this height, the height of the smaller triangle, divided by the height of the larger triangle. 
And so what we're trying to do now is solve this proportion for s. Let's do that. Now you can do this on the board if you want to give the students practice in solving equations like that, but if, you, if that's not your main thrust, you can just have Maple do it. Let's have this solve. We're going to isolate the expression. Oops, sorry. We're going to isolate the expression for s. And there we go. So it has solved this for s in terms of h, d, and the two r's. And now the plan is to substitute this value of s into this expression. And that's going to look absolutely horrid. And there was no way on earth I would ever do that on a chalkboard when I've only got 15 minutes left in class. It would bore kids to tears, and uh, I would lose almost all of them, maybe except the, the top student. So what we're going to do is let's copy that expression for s. Copy that. And now we're going to take this expression, right-click on it, and evaluate it at that value of s. So I'm going to pipe paste what I copied. There it is. Click OK. And there it is. In its full, horrible looking glory, there is f of d. And notice on the right side, there's nothing but d's, big r's, little r's, and h's. Little s is now gone. And we have never in our high school lives ever had students try to solve equations like that. Now, d is the independent variable. What kind of a function is it? Why don't we uh, manipulate this a little bit, and we're going to let Maple do the hard work here. So let us, let us collect, oops, I want to just grab this part here. I'm just going to copy that, paste it there. And let's collect d. That means we're going to try to factor out d if possible. And this is the expression that results. So we have this big long thing times d cubed. So what you can do in Maple is highlight that. Let's make it a different color so students can see it. Some big nasty thing times d cubed minus some other big nasty thing times d squared plus another nasty thing times d. So what kind of a function is that? Well, if we're advanced, advanced functions, kids should recognize that is a polynomial. That is a cubic polynomial in d recognizing that this is just a parameter which would reduce to a constant when we fill in the values. So basically what it's going to come down to is solving a cubic equation, because remember we want to set this thing equal to 3 fifths and solve for little d. This would be a good time, just to have mercy on our poor grade 11s and grade 12s, to actually put in values for r, little r, and h. So let's copy this expression down here. We're going to paste that. And those are the values that I measured in my basement. So let's put them in. Let's evaluate at a point. And we're going to let h be 8. Big R is 4.5. Little d we don't know. Little r is 3. And lo and behold, take a look at that. There we have a cubic function. This is, more, this is what students are more used to see. Now normally we give them integer coefficients, but this shouldn't scare them too badly. And when we graph this, we get this. It looks kind of cubic if we were to, to blow that up, blow that out a little bit. Yeah. No, I didn't graph beyond 8. That's OK. And what are we trying to do here? Remember, we are trying to set that equal to 3 fifths and solve for d. Let's do it graphically before we do it algebraically. So here's the curve. 3 fifths is 0 0.6, so we are trying to find the value of d that gives us 0 0.6. So we make a dotted line, come across, read down, aha, d should be 4. That tells us that we need to scoop to 4 centimeters to get 60% of that tub's volume. Now, could we get the same thing algebraically? If you've taught your students how to solve cubic equations, go ahead and try. It's not going to work very well because the, you don't have a... We do not have a cubic analog of the quadratic formula. Now, if this were equal to 0, we could simply factor out a d and be left over with quadratic, but this is equal to a constant, not 0. So we probably haven't taught our students how to do that. So let's let Maple do it. Let us, let's copy that, set it equal to 3 fifths. Sorry, we'll come down here. 
set that equal to 3 over 5, and now let us solve that for d. Now, we get three solutions here. We get d equals 4 point something. We get d equals some number plus some number times i plus the conjugate of that. Now, if you've taught your students imaginary numbers and complex conjugates, this is a great uh, application of that. If you haven't, you can just tell them to ignore it and take a look at the real solution. Oh, that's exactly what we predicted. It's a little bit more than 4, which is what the graph sees. So here we have a confluence of the analytical solution, the algebraic solution, with a graphical solution. And what's neat to show kids is you might ask somebody, do you notice any difference in the coefficients of those d's? Notice that this coefficient is very, very small. This one is about an order of magnitude larger, and that's an order of or, sorry, magnitude order of magnitude larger than that. You might wonder what happens if you simply throw that away. Could we approximate that function as a quadratic? There's another exploration you could go to and see if you kids could use the quadratic equation to solve that for d, and see if the result comes close to what we got when we did it precisely when we didn't throw away the cubic term. A lot of directions you can take this. Now, while I was doing all this, uh, my eight-year-old daughter came into the kitchen. She looked at the recipe. She scooped out what she thought was about the right amount, made a wonderful cream cheese frosting, and it tasted great. And I finished this uh, little mathematical exercise just in time to see the frosted cake being served. So it turned out that I was actually useless, and uh, my mathematical skill was uh, for naught. But I, I felt good knowing that I had found the correct depth to the nearest ten-thousandth of a millimeter, That felt good to it. So what is the moral of this story? The moral is, teach your kids to look out for fun math problems in their daily lives. Making cream cheese frosting with your kids, going bike riding, going on vacation, buying stuff at the store. Mathematics is all around you. And everything you do, no matter how simple it seems, is full of fun math problems that you can pluck out of the air and turn into a neat lesson the next day. And now we come to one of my favorite applications of all time, the mathematics of procrastination. Here's some observations about people working under a deadline. What I've noticed about myself is that the farther away the deadline is, doesn't matter what it is, work, school, uh, home life, whatever, farther away the deadline, the more slowly I work. And it's not until the deadline approaches that I start to work faster and faster, until at some point I reach the, as this top working speed. I can't go any faster. And I continue at that speed until the deadline. And hopefully that was good enough to get whatever job was done, done. And as I noticed that about myself, I was wondering, can I model that behavior mathematically? Because I see it in other people too. I see it in my students, see it in my wife, my own kids. And here's kind of the idea. Let's make a little graph here, just a little thought experiment. This, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is your working speed. And suppose here's your deadline. It's some, at some value of t. There it is. And this is what most of us are like. We, at, when we get the assignment of the job, whether it's marking papers or uh, trying to get a lesson done or getting kids out the door to go to church, you start out really slow. You think you have a lot of time, but then you slowly start to get faster. You get faster and faster until at some point you can't get any faster and you cruise at that top speed until the deadline hits. So you're either late for church or you made it. Now, what is this doing? If you're a lazy bum like me, you're like this. You don't start getting fast very fast at all. Your speed, your acceleration is low and you don't even hit your top speed by the time the deadline is upon you. Now, if you're, little, if you're more like my wife, you're more like this. You reach your top speed pretty quickly, you cruise and you get the job done. Now, if you're a total keener, like you're just on top of everything, well, that means that you're more like this. You reach your top speed almost immediately. So as soon as you get the task, you are up and running it at this full throttle and you continue. 
or if you're absolutely perfectly keen, it takes you no time at all to reach top speed. But very few of us are like that, at least not all the time. Now let's take a look at this point, a slightly different repre physical representation of that problem. This is the same kind of graphic, except I've filled in the area under the curve. And if I were presenting this to students, I might ask them, what do you think the area under that curve represents? Give them a second to think about that, and they should realize absolutely nothing, because not one of them is going to understand that the first time through. So once I'm finished looking at their blank stares, I'm going to push this up to infinity and see if that helps. Okay. Now what do you think the area represents? And by now some of them should be saying, oh wait a minute, that's, that's your total time that you can work times your top speed. Let's see, time times speed, speed times time is distance. They learned that in science. Or if it's working speed, it's how much are you accomplished. Okay, so the area under this curve here is how much you get done. So if, if your task is say marking papers, and this is the speed at which you're, you're grading papers, and you have this deadline here, the area of the curve represents how many papers you got marked by the deadline. Or if you're driving, how many kilometers or miles you traveled by the time the deadline hit. So what that means is, the keener you are, the more responsible you are, the more you accomplish before the deadline. Now obviously that begs the question, what is this area over here? Let's take a look at a slightly different representation. So if the green area represents my accomplishment, the yellow area represents what I did not accomplish. See, if I'd been going at full speed, I would have accomplished all that. But because I procrastinated, because I didn't reach my top speed right away, I lost some accomplishment. So I think of this yellow area here as the cost of procrastination. And so a neat little exploration is to have students calculate this area. They know how to do it. What shape is it? Oh, yeah, it's a trapezoid. They know how to find areas of trapezoids. They can find areas of triangles. It's a neat little exercise. That's a great thing for grade 9 or 10. But what if we assume a nonlinear model here? This is not terribly accurate because it, it assumes that you kind of increase your speed at a nice uniform rate. But that's not how most people work. People are even worse procrastinators than that. What tends to happen in real life is you don't even start to approach your top speed until the deadline is really getting close. So you start at a very slow speed, you don't get much faster, but then as the deadline approaches you really panic and then you start to get close. Okay, now I'm at top speed. And a more keen person would reach that top speed faster, whereas a slacker like me would wait till the very last second before they even start to get fast. And here, once again, you can ask, what's the area under that curve? Nice calculus question. What's the area of that curve? Another nice calculus question. Now, if this were a grade 9 class, I would not show them this one. I would stick with the linear model, because that's what they know. So they know y equals mx plus b. Let's do some explorations with this model. So they know about slopes of lines, y-intercepts. We haven't shown them piecewise, func piecewise functions yet, but that's all right. So let's... Do what we taught, them, what we always teach them to do, set up your independent variables. Let's let t represent the time since we got the assignment, whether it's a report or getting kids out the door or grading papers, whatever. Let d be your deadline, so that's a time. Let k represent how keen we are to finish the assignment, so that might be so how quickly we approach that, that uh, top speed there. Let's let x max represent our top working speed the fastest we can possibly go, and let t max represent how long it takes us to reach that top speed. So that would be in, in this representation here, the value of t at which the sloped line starts to become a flat line. So this value of t here, that is your t max. And if you are a total keener, sorry, if you're a normal slacker, your t max is equal to the deadline. If you're a total keener, your t max is zero. Whereas if you're a slacker, your Tmax is beyond the deadline. And our independent variable, let's let S represent our current working speed at time t. And for our model, for grade 9 model, let's assume that our working speed is proportional to the time. 
And we've taught kids what that word means. That means that your independent variable is equal to your dependent variable times a constant. S equals K times T. So K is how keen you are. This is a great time to ask, okay, so what are M and B? If you know Y equals MX plus B, what's the M here? Kids should be able to say, okay, your slope is K, so the slope of your line is your keenness, and your Y-intercept is zero. In other words, I start at zero speed when I'm first starting out. So here's some questions we can explore. How long does it take to reach our top speed, given our keenness, the deadline, and our top speed? What's the most we could possibly accomplish? And question three, how much will we accomplish at our current keenness level? Let's answer those one at a time. So how long, how do long, do we, how long does it take to reach top speed? So here's our formula, s equals kt. That means we need to solve s max equals kt for t. Well, kids should be able to do that. Okay, you solve for t, divide both sides by k. So we get that t max is equal to s max over k. Actually, let's put the capital in there, sorry. We're going to hold on to that value because we're going to need it later. So before you go on, ask kids, what is the effect of k on t max? Well, they should know that the bigger the denominator of a fraction is, the smaller the fraction becomes. And does that make physical sense? If you're highly keen, let's see, that makes this fraction should be small. So that means my t max is low. Does that make sense? Let's see, if I'm really keen, my t max is low. That means I reach my top speed quickly. Yes, that makes sense. All right, good. So now that we've established that understanding, let's move on to the next question. How keen would we have to be to reach top speed immediately? Now, the word immediately means we teach kids to interpret words in terms of equations. Well, that means that t equals 0. Is there a way to make t max equal to 0? Well, s max can't is a constant, so that can't happen. k would have to be infinity. So you can lead a little discussion and try to conclude that k has to be infinite in order to reach top speed right away. Now, what's the most we could accomplish? Let's go back to that green picture up above. So let's go here. The most we could possibly accomplish is if we're infinitely keen. That's the area of this rectangle. So have kids figure that out. What's the, what's the length and width of this rectangle? Okay, the length is the deadline, the width is top speed. Okay, so the area should be d times s max. That's the most we could possibly accomplish. So, so that should be d times s max. But that's if we're infinitely keen. How much are we going to accomplish at our current keenness level? Let's take a look at this graph. So we need to find the area under this curve. In other words, we need to find the area of a trapezoid. Haha, -ha, at long last, we finally answered the question. When they, back when you did geometry, they said, why do we ever need to know this? Why do we need to find areas of trapezoids? I never see trapezoids in real life. Well, here you go. There's your first trapezoid that you really need to find the area of. How do we do it? Okay, ask the class. What's the area formula? Hopefully they remember. You take the base plus the length of the top, divide by 2, and multiply by the height. But now we need to fill in the values. What is the length of the base? Okay, that's D. So B1 has to be D. All right, what's the, what's the length of the top? Well, it's the distance from there to there. Now, this is where you're going to get stuck. You might need a few minutes to show kids this or to lead them through it. But eventually, you want to show them that this is D minus T max. Okay, so B2 is going to be D minus T max. And H should be, how tall is that? Well, that's S max. So once again, let's highlight this and fill in the values. Right click. evaluate. Okay, so there's the area formula. But remember, we had an expression for t max. We solved that earlier. Remember when we did that? Let's look back up here. 
Okay, we, saw, we said that t max is equal to s max over k. Let's substitute that in. So now let's evaluate this expression. Let's let t max be what we said. We said that is s max divided by k. Okay, so the area is 1 half times 2d minus s max over k times s max. Let's expand that. Kids should know how to do that. You can do this on the board or you can have Maple do it. And there it is. s max times d minus 1 half s max squared over k. Now, they ha probably haven't seen quadratic things yet, so, so treat that lightly. But they should now see that the area, this thing that you accomplish, is now proportional to your deadline, and k is in the denominator, but s max squared. And then you could say things like, all right, suppose I have to accomplish a certain amount. Suppose accomplishment has to be 6, and I know s max is 100 and d is 5. Let's solve for k. Let's suppose I have to accomplish, uh, let's say, 100. I have, get, have to get 100 papers graded. My deadline is uh, 5 hours from now, and I don't know what my k is, but I know my top working speed is, say, uh, 6 papers per hour, something like that. So now we need to solve this for k. They know how to do that, or they should. And uh, you can lead them through that. That's a good board exercise, good exercise, good homework problem for them. And te to, to uh, test our answer here, let's solve that for k and see what we get. Negative 9 over 35. So we have to have a negative keenness. Not sure, quite sure what that means. But uh, anyway, you can go on with that. The last thing I want to show you today is what if you used a nonlinear model? Because here we saw we had to be infinitely keen to reach top speed right away. Let's go back to our nonlinear model here. This is more realistic because most people don't get faster at a steady rate. They tend to panic at the end of the deadline. Let's model that. So let's assume, so we're now in a grade 11 or grade 12 class. We're well, so we, we've studied uh, advanced functions like reciprocal functions and uh, square root functions, exponential functions, and so on. So now we're ready to apply. Let's assume our working speed is inversely proportional to the time remaining before the deadline. In other words, the less time there remains, the larger our working speed becomes. So here's our model. Inversely proportional to the time remaining before the deadline. That means it's a constant times 1 over that. That's our speed. What does that look like? It's right here. Now let's answer the same questions we did in grade 9. How long does it take us to reach our top speed? So we have to solve s max equals k over d minus t max and solve that for t max. And I'll ask kids before we start, do you think we have to be infinitely keen to reach top speed right away? In other words, to have this situation Let's see, I, could, I can't go quite over, I didn't make the animation go far enough. But to go infinitely keen, where we're not losing any accomplishment, let's solve that for t max. Once again, I'd have them do it on paper, then we'll verify with maple. Let us solve that for variable t max. Uh huh, so t max is s max times d minus k over s max. Actually, let's do it in slightly different ways. It's usually better if we isolate instead of solve. That way we don't get the brackets. So let's isolate for t max. There we go. So t max is negative k over s max plus d. Does that make physical sense? Let's see. The larger d is, the larger t max should be. That makes sense because the longer the deadline is, the longer people wait to get the top speed. That makes sense. Does it make sense that when k is large that this should be low? Yes, because there's a negative in front of here and inversely for s max. So no, we do not have to be infinitely keen, because if we let t max equal 0, that means we're infinitely keen, solve that for k. So let's evaluate this expression at t max equals 0. There it is. And now we need to solve that for k.
And so it turns out that k is equal to s max times d, which is not infinite. So in order to, be, to reach our top speed right away, our keenness level has to be s max times d. Now if you're really sharp, you'll realize that that is simply the area of the rectangular part, because that's this times the height. Okay, so now let's figure out how much do we have, how much do we accomplish as a function of k and d. So here's our speed graph. So we want to find the area under this curve. Now if this were an AP calculus class where we've already done integration, uh, we can go in that direction. If we haven't done integration, which is most likely the case, we would just do this kind of behind the scenes. So I'm going to hide this for a second. I'll show you how to do this. In case you were teaching a calculus class and you wanted to go through this, or you wanted to do it for yourself, let's actually calculate the integral. So what do we need to do? We need to find the integral. So let's go over our context menu here. Go from t equals 0 up through t max. And our function is k divided by uh, d minus t. Our integration variable is t. And that gives us the area up until the blue dashed line. And the area of the rectangle past that, we don't need an integral for that, we can just multiply length times width. The length is d minus t max. And multiplied by s max. Now we're in for a rude shock here because Maple says, oh, hang on, we can't determine if d is between 0 and 2 max. Try to use assumptions. So Maple's trying to get all fancy on us. So all we need, need to do here is we need to make a little assumption. Let's assume that everything is positive and that d is greater than t max. Actually, we may have to do this late. Let's stop that for a second here. We'll do this part. We'll attach this to the end here once we've done it. So let's get rid of this. Okay, there's that. And now let's give that a name here. Let's call it A1. And so now A2 is simply going to be A1 plus the stuff we got rid of. And this is this. Now once again, we have a formula for t max. Let's substitute that in there. Let's see, where did we find it? We said back up here that t max was this. So let's highlight this now. Oops. Copy that. And now we're going to evaluate this, where t max is now this value. Aha, uh -huh. so there is a formula for how much we accomplish as a function of k, d, and s max. And what we notice is that d is in a logarithm. In other words, if d doubles, that does not mean that we accomplish twice as much. That's a neat thing to know. So we can also pull a k out of here. So let's collect with respect to k. So we factored out a k here, and let's see what's left. So it looks like we're almost linearly proportional to k, with some other stuff thrown in there. But the dependence on the, on the deadline is not proportional. And let's see a graph of that. So what we're seeing here is our level of accomplishment as a function of our keenness k. And it, it grows not quite linearly. And my slider here is showing the k curve for various values of the deadline. So as I increase the deadline, of course I accomplish more, but not radically more. So if I were, say, at 10, so my deadline is 10, and suppose I want to go up to 20, I double the length of my deadline, I do not double my accomplishment. That's a, that's a marvelous fact about human behavior, because we were so we're so slow to get started that that extra time is really wasted. Doubling the deadline does not double our accomplishment. 